and director of the Tel Aviv University Batia and Israel Fisher Center for Corporate Governance and Capital Markets Recognition. He's also a research associate at the European Corporate Governance Institute. Before joining Tel Aviv University Law, Professor Kamal was a professor of law and director of the University of Southern California Business Law Program. He teaches courses in corporation security regulation mergers and acquisitions, um, quantitative uh, empirical methods and deal, deal planning, and has published articles in little, leading scholarly journals such as Columbia Law Review, Cornell Law Review, Georgetown Law, Law Journal, Stanford Law Review, uh, etc. Harvard? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so welcome, uh, uh, Wood, and... Uh, I need the, the mouse. Oh, yeah. Do you want to sit here? Yeah, maybe With, uh, with criticism. My main complaint about uh, this book is that I didn't write it. <laughs> this is, uh, and I'll repeat some, um, something that uh, previous uh, discussants mentioned. It has two uh, virtues in my view, uh, among others, but two important ones that uh, I find as a, as a scholar very difficult to to achieve. First, it is extremely readable, uh, extremely accessible, and it's making complex ideas accessible. It's not simple. The, the notions that are covered in this book and the ground that is covered in this book is not at all uh, 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 simple. Believe me, uh, I read a lot of the uh, uh, financial world uh, mumbo-jumbo that makes everything sound so complex and when you read it in David's book, it's uh, it's it's really a joy to read, and it makes so it makes it makes sense and makes us think that maybe we're not as smart as we thought. <laughs> so that's the that's the first virtue. And the second, uh, Yael uh, talked about courage, and uh, I admire the passion and the conviction and the sense of purpose in this book. That I, as a as a as an academic. Uh, I'm always looking for this big idea that will be not only uh, intellectually um, uh, captivating for me, but also will feel right and important and big enough uh, to convey to the world. And uh, maybe I'll find it one day, but uh, uh, I think that David definitely uh, was right on when he uh, uh, put it in, in, in this book. So. Uh, and you, and you can feel it, you can tell when you read it that this is something that comes from the heart and goes to the heart and uh, uh, has a, does a, a terrific job in uh, marrying uh, you know, intellectual uh, analysis, the academic analysis with very uh, specific uh, practical uh, roadmap for uh, um, investors, in very large important investors in the market, how they should uh, go about changing uh, the world in which they, uh, they and we uh, live. And I share uh, Yair's sentiment that this has a big potential, it really can make a big difference. And it's kind of embarrassing to think how uh, easy things are for those uh, uh, institutions and why they have never done them before. They're starting to discover their uh, power and uh, let's see what happens next. Having said that, I want to, uh, my job here is to offer some uh, uh, criticism and uh, to play the devil's advocate. So this is what I will do. Uh, and I, 
Yes, my focus will be on the question, who is the audience of this book? Um, uh, Ron mentioned a, a good point that, um, that it's going to be difficult. There is some clash, potential clash, between uh, the objectives of those uh, union uh, funds um, and the um, fiduciary duties of the directors heading those directing in, in those corporations in which they invest. And Ron said, look, if you want to pick and choose and select the directors, the boards that do your, that follow your uh, preferences, that's one thing that's doable. Um, but if you really want to uh, use the voice uh, option and stay there as an investor, and then make them do your bidding, uh, they will have some problems with their duties towards the corporation and the shareholders. I want to make this point uh, even broader. It's not only about their fiduciary duties. We can change the law. I mean, here at the university, we're free to imagine any law we want. The question is, do we want to change the law? Should we change the law? Uh, because in my view, there is a potential clash between the objectives of those uh, uh, employees and the uh, best interest of the corporation as a whole. So, so this is this is a one of many fantastic quotes that I have to choose from from the book, uh, and it's the credo. I use that word because it's almost like gospel. The, you say, David, my confidence in the activists, I skip some words portrayed in this book, stems from the fact that the interests of their members coincide with the interest of a far greater percentage of the public than any other sector of finance. The tens of millions of Americans invested in these pension funds and union funds are working and middle class people. They are increasingly marginalized in the halls of power. And I agree. But the problem is this. If we uh, really try to advance the best interest of this group, are we not going to uh, ignore, to, to overstep the interests of other shareholders and the corporation? So here is one story that I think it's chapter five, but I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. So here's a story from the book in the years 2011 to 2013. One of the largest uh, union <coughs> funds, the AFSCME, is there a way of saying it? AFSCME. AFSCME. So AFSCME tried to force JP Morgan's uh, Chase CEO, Jamie Dimon, uh, to give up his dual position as both CEO and chair of the board of directors. It was okay for him to stay in the CEO, but not also chair of the board of directors. And as David describes it, there was a first attempt that didn't go very far in 2011. He doesn't really elaborate on that one because it didn't win much support, but then it was a much more significant support from shareholders in 2012. 40% of the shareholders who cast their vote uh, supported the, the unions, the, the union funds uh, proposal uh, uh, to demand that, uh, that, that, that Jamie Dunham step down as, as chair of the board. Interestingly, four days before the vote, uh, a big scandal, uh, at least a big flop of J.P. Morgan Chase uh, became uh, uh, published, uh, publicized, uh, uh, the so-called London whale uh, trader that worked for the bank lost all in all about six billion dollars I think mm -hmm. and it was just too late to affect the uh, uh, voting outcome in this election but it certainly stayed in the minds of investors for the following year and indeed uh, the union tried in the following year uh, to get uh, again another similar proposal and this time it even had the support of 
I think two or three other important investors, uh, two states, I forget which ones. I think New York and New York. Yeah, yeah. They also had their pension funds supported it, but uh, it didn't work. 32% of the shareholders supported it, but still, it's, this is significant. This is not unimportant. And it was clear, it was totally expected that this proposal will come up again in 2014. But it did. And David explains why. It did. Turns out that the city of Detroit filed for the largest single bankruptcy of a municipality in the United States and was about to give a haircut to the pensions of uh, city employees, which was illegal, but he filed for bankruptcy. And in the bankruptcy filings that were accepted by the judge, this was part of the part of the deal. And then negotiations started involving this uh, labor, uh, this um, union fund. It was all very secretive, but the bottom line was that uh, in 2014, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase chipped in hundred million dollars towards the fund, the bankruptcy fund, and lo and behold, the employees represented by that uh, fund uh, got a much smaller haircut than they would have otherwise uh, got. And so that's, you know, exhibit A of how a fund is doing exactly what David thinks it should do, uh, but if it was indeed so important to separate the roles of the CEO and the chair of the board, that uh, objective was uh, given up. Another case in point, this one is a more general point, this is a quote from uh, several pages later down the book. If pension, it should be funds, and labor union funds do not have a way of measuring and accounting for the job's impact, maybe it's job impact, well, anyway, of investments, then no one in the market will. And here's the important part. Corporations, hedge funds, and private equity funds analyze the question from the perspective of investment returns and do not incur the costs of reductions in jobs and pay. If anything, they often benefit from such losses. Well, this is basically a statement that if this is true, then labor, uh, you know, funds representing labor should ask the corporations, should pressure the corporations to forfeit uh, to leave money on the table in order to secure jobs of some of their employees who are affiliated with those unions. Perhaps not all employees, perhaps only those affiliated with this particular <coughs> union, but let's assume even that uh, their purpose is that all employees of this organization will benefit. What about uh, investors? they might actually lose. So the question is this that I'll put here. Can this circle be squared? That is, it is one thing to say, look, we don't really care. It's Corporate law doesn't try to fix the world, doesn't try to make this world perfect. For example, there are some goals that we give up up front. We don't try to protect custom, clients, customers. For that, we have antitrust law or other types of, uh, you know, uh, consumer protection re regulation. So corporate law doesn't try to fix that. But here we have a, 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 um, an idea to try to help labor through corporate law. You could say, you know, we as union funds, we care about, about our lot. And we, and we care about, we are fiduciaries to our fund participants and you know the rest of the world you know après moi le deluge we, 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 we don't care about the others which is fine but if we try to make the extra step and say and by the way this is good for everybody then this has to be established and 
and, and I think this perhaps is uh, the, the, the mission for the next book, if, if, if you're thinking about one. That is that everybody can actually better off, be better off. So David actually addresses this question square up, squarely. And he says, I don't remember the exact page, but he says it's true. Worker funds might indeed have special interest. I admit that, I concede that. But he says, you know, così fan tutti, everybody does that. It's okay, all shareholders, he says, management has its own interests, and other shareholders have their own interests, and nobody has any qualms about that. I would stop, I wouldn't, certainly management has its own interests, eh, eh, goals, but I'm not so sure that other shareholders do. Even those hedge funds, you know, everybody's like JR, if anyone remembers this uh, TV series Dallas, everybody loves to hate them. So uh, they may be short-sighted, they may think about the next quarter, but, but they only benefit as shareholders. They have no other interest involved. So if their shares drop in value, that's it for them. Here we have a group of investors who wear two hats. And so they have perhaps some divided loyalties in this sense. Now, another argument that David puts forward is that worker funds depend on support from other shareholders. That is, they can't get very far if they do not win the support of the investors at large, shareholders at large, and so those other shareholders are no fools. They will support only will only, uh, you know, uh, proposals and, and initiatives that uh, coincide with their, with their investing interest. This is an empirical question. You know, you could say about hedge funds, and it certainly had been, had been, has been said about hedge funds, that they can't get very far without the support of institutional investors because they do not individually own enough shares. But is this true for uh, those uh, public pension funds and union funds? I'm not sure. This is an empirical question. They may be able, they may have enough sway to actually get their way without the support of others. And third, or last, uh, David says, and you know what, if worst comes to worst, and uh, labor uh, 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 funds uh, do get something to the exclusion of everybody else, it's a small price to pay for all this positive influence that they have on the firm. This reminds me of something that I read in a book on corporate law that uh, Bob Clark wrote in, in 1986. And it was an analysis of self-dealing and why it should be illegal, or why, it should, why it's not a good thing. And one of the arguments for self-dealing is that, you know, it's a way of compensating fiduciaries if we let them take a little bit, a little bit for themselves on the side, under the table. But the word under the table already gives you the problem here. The problem is that it has no limits and the limit is only <coughs> the ambition of the fiduciary, in this case the union, the union funds. Their ability, their access, uh, and their self-restraint are the only controls over their use of their power to their own to their own personal interest, to the exclusion of everybody else. I feel a little queasy about that. Now, do we have how much time do I have? Three minutes? Okay, I'm almost done. So do we have evidence on conflicts? We have plenty of evidence on conflicts in different contexts. So for example, in the United States, we have an article by Rubeck and Zimmerman that unionization is associated with a reduction in equity value. We have Bertrand and Mulainathan. They find that when managers are insulated from takeovers, they pay their workers more, especially those white worker, white collar workers. They uh, do not close uh, plants, but they don't not open new ones. Productivity and profitability declines in those in response to these laws. And then there is Cronquist and his colleagues, 
and they find that entrenched CEOs pay more to employees that are closer to them in the corporate hierarchy, that they are here geographically closer to the headquarters, they're associated with in conflict in uh, inclined unions. I don't, I don't want to waste all my time. So I'll just, and there are some articles from Germany talking about co-determination and worker councils, uh, worker councils, uh, uh, I, I actually found, after I finished writing these slides, another article by Paul Davis that's a little more optimistic. It's called Efficiency Arguments for the Collective Representation of Workers, a sketch. It's a chapter from a book that came out in 2014. So I'm not saying that this is conclusive evidence. All I'm saying is that there is some incriminating evidence about what happens when a corporation really does listen very carefully to its employees. And what I guess my call to you is to come up with new evidence that will show that in this context, which is quite still different from the context I described in those, in those uh, papers, it actually can create value for everybody's interest. So for example, some questions that I would like to see answers for if we can. Can union funds win, win without the support of other shareholders? How often do they achieve special interest goals, uh, do they abandon, abandon shareholder goals uh, for those special interest goals, uh, what happens to share value, and if there, is there any way of measuring the combined share value and labor value. I remember that Jeff Gordon tried like 10 years ago to do something like this, I don't, I don't know that he got it uh, finished, because it, was, it is really mighty hard to do something like this. But until we have this evidence, my suspicion is that it's something's got to give. If you are going to advance shareholder labor interest, it's going to come at the expense of somebody else. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.